Hello, my name is Candace Vinson. I am the Outreach and Events Coordinator at VIMS, and I will be your host for this session. In this session, we're excited to have Dr. Ryan Carnegie, Research Professor at VIMS, to discuss shellfish diseases. Hi. Hello, Hi. Dr. Carnegie. Hi there. Hey. So one of our questions coming in is, why did dermo get worse, do we know? Well, um, that's, a, that's a topic that we've been paying a lot of attention to over the last several years. And this is part of the, you know, sort of the, the history um, of our region with oyster diseases. You know, for some reason, they got a lot worse in the, in the 1980s. And uh, for a long time, we thought that that was due to um, the fact that the, the 80s were a very warm, very dry period. Uh, the, the very warm temperatures and saltier waters favoring the, the, the parasite. And this is a directly transmissible parasite that spreads from oyster to oyster to oyster, you know, on a reef or in a, an aquaculture population. So when conditions are more favorable, that promoted transmission, promoted more disease, and that higher level of infection and disease carried across the decades, all the way from the 80s to today. That was the story. Um, what we're realizing now is that actually something more fundamental happened with the parasite in that it increased in, in virulence in, in the 1980s. It became essentially a different parasite than it had been before. Um, it used to infect deeper, um, deep, deeper parts of the oyster body. It transitioned to being a parasite of the digestive tract at that time. It shortened its life cycle and started causing much more intense infections and higher levels of mortality. And we think that this, so we recognize this as, as an evolutionary change. And we think it probably connected um, in a way to the state of the oysters after the arrival of the other parasite you know, years earlier, which sort of depleted the oyster populations, disadvantaged a parasite, derma or Perkinsis, that required a lot of you know, very dense oyster uh, populations to transmit and, and so on. So this, it was an increase in virulence that sort of connected to the state of, of, of the oyster populations and has been lasting. Um, what we see today dates back to the 1980s and it's in sort of its, its presentation to us. It's a good question. Yeah, so kind of on that note, does Dermo make the oysters more susceptible to other diseases? That's an excellent question. And uh, in fact, we have, we have a, an NSF REU student who's starting her work. Um, she may be watching this presentation. She's starting her work on Monday morning and she's gonna be working on exactly that, that topic. Um, we don't know. We know that Dermo coexists with other diseases such as MSX. We don't have a good handle on whether they're interacting at all. And that is a question. So we're actually going to be looking much more closely at that question um, over the coming months this summer with this visiting student. Virtually. Are exciting for it? Yeah. Are some genotypes of Virginia oysters less susceptible to Dermo than others? If known, have those genotypes been implemented in more in oyster farming? Well, it's, it's absolutely the case that there's variability in oyster populations in their susceptible, susceptibility to, to dermo. Um, one of the things we found, and, and this applies to MSX too, is that um, paras or oyster populations in low salinity waters at the far upper end of the James or the Rappahannock or the top of the bay, where the salinities are lower and where they've not been exposed to these parasites as much, the parasites like basically half strength seawater and above. Um, so where these oyster populations exist in lower salinity waters, those populations have a very high level of susceptibility to the diseases. Uh, to the contrary, oysters that are from populations in the lower parts of the big rivers, the lower part of the bay, the seaside eastern shore where the salinities are higher, where they have exposure to these diseases all the time, there's a higher level of resistance in those populations, and those are the populations that have been incorporated into breeding programs, such as at the VIMS ABC, to promote these, these lines of oysters for, for growth by industry. Gotcha. Um, so what efforts are taking place to kill slash control these pathogens? Well, so these are environmental pathogens uh, that are ubiquitous in our region. So there's no, there's no possibility of eradication. The animals, like the oysters, the clams, you know, these are animals that don't have ad adaptive immune systems where we could immunize them against Dermo or MSX or, or QPX in the case of clams so that they would be, you know, immune to, to future challenges. That is just not a possibility. 
So our key tools with regard to aquaculture, like Dr. Uh, Small talked about earlier, um, are, is selective breeding. You're making sure that we're, we're getting into the breeding programs, animals that we know um, or we're very confident have the right set of genes so that when they're bred, they're gonna pass those genes for resistance and fast growth on to be able to withstand the diseases in an aquaculture context. And we're also very, very involved in, in you know, uh, resource management of the wild fishery. Um, how do we manage wild oyster populations? How do we restore oyster populations? And one of our key tools in that area is, uh, is sanctuaries. Preserving, protecting, you know, conserving some component of these wild populations where they can just work things out with these parasites for, you know, and, and stay alive, passing on their good genes through reproduction as for as long as they can, rather than having them harvested, for example, after just a year or two, when they wouldn't have exerted really or exercise the benefits of, of having a good set of genes that they could survive for 10 years and reproduce, you know, eight or 10 or 12 times. So those are our major tools with regard to wild and, and culture populations. Okay. So will these oyster diseases harm humans if ingested? No. And, and you know, this is something that I, uh, I, I try to always um, point out to audiences. These, these are pathogens of the oysters themselves. QPX in the case of clams is a clam parasite. They are not pathogens of human consumers in any way. Um, they are ubiquitous. Um, they are, you know, Dermo in particular could be prevalent in 100% of oysters in a Virginia population. This is probably just something that you don't want to think about if you're going to the restaurant to eat oysters, but they're completely harmless. They're generally present at, at relatively low levels in the hosts. It's just something that's, that's inherent in, in eating a product like an oyster or a clam that you know, you're not, you're not sectioning a filet off of the animal like you would a fish. You're eating the whole thing. You're eating what's eating them. You're eating what's living in them, which is part of the beauty of, of, of connecting with the marine environment by eating things like oysters and clams. Um, the parasites are probably just the, the, the part of it that you don't want to think too much about. Yeah. So we have sort of two more topics to cover here. So one is um, things that harm oysters. Have you noticed any pollution from fracking that affects them or any effects that warm water has on die off? So fracking effects, no. I think all, all of that activity, um, I mean, there could be, you know, I would imagine, um, I mean, this, this is something that, that we, we, you know, we worry about getting into the groundwater. The groundwater eventually makes its way to, you know, to, to the bay. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's probably work going on looking at, at sort of upper watershed issues and, and certainly agricultural pollution, but some of this other, um, you know, uh, extractive, you know, fracking industries and, and something. But, you know, far downstream where we're talking about oyster resources, I, I, I don't know that anybody's looking at that, but I, I wouldn't be concerned about direct effects at all on, on these resources in any way. In terms of warm water, um, yeah, you know, there's climate is changing, of course, as, as the audience has been hearing, and, and you know, there are going to be any number of effects on, on our resource populations. And certainly warming water, warming climate um, is going to affect things like oyster reproduction, the timing of when they're reproducing. Um, it, it's also going to affect parasites like derma. You know, warmer environments could, could be more challenging for oysters with regard to a disease like derma that really loves warm summer temperatures, temperatures above 20 or 25 degrees Celsius. If we have longer periods of, of high temperatures in the summer, we have a potentially longer period of, of exposure to intense dermo disease. So that's, that's a potential concern and a, and a worry, but um, what I would say is that, you know, the oysters are, are you know, evolving, you know, in, in response to dermo pressure. You know, if dermo intensifies because of warming temperature, it's possible that the selective pressure on oysters, you know, the, the evolutionary incentive for them to develop proper disease resistance may be intensified too. So we, we can't necessarily pick a winner and a loser with regard to an interaction like oysters and, and dermo under climate change. Good point. So we are sort of running out of time. I do want to throw one more out there just because I think it's really important and good to end on. If you want to give a quick few things, if you have any information on this, we can put it below and under resources, the links. But how can the public and Virginians 
support oyster growers and farmers in wild oysters and in particularly during the pandemic? I think the most important thing right now is just to, is to buy this, this product and consume this product. And it was pointed out earlier in, in Dr. Small's presentation, um, you know, the, the, the health benefits of, of, of oysters and the, you know, the ecological benefits of, of producing this type of, 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 of protein for, for human populations. Um, there's a lot of, you know, rare minerals and, and nutrients that are present in oysters and clams that you're not going to be able to easily find anywhere else. This is very nutritious food for humans to be consuming. And right now, what the industries really need is for us to continue to find ways to, to buy these products and, and take them off their hands. The oyster industries in particular have been challenged by the, the closing of all of these restaurants due to the, the coronavirus. Oysters in particular are consumed through restaurants. Clams, I think, work their way more to the supermarkets and, and people are more comfortable with clams at, at home. But oysters, you know, if we can, as a society, buy oysters, learn how to shuck them, order shucking knives and, and gloves online, get familiar with how to, how to work with them in, in the household. This kind of thing is gonna be tremendously beneficial to these developing industries, especially as they're challenged by the virus today. All really, really good points. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Carnegie. Our time is definitely up. Thank you so much for being here and helping us learn more about shellfish diseases and how they impact oysters and humans. And so we wanna thank First Advantage Federal Credit Union for supporting this session and bringing this to you and have a great day. Thank you so much.